There we go. So I'd like to introduce uh, the inspiration around CDMC from a couple of years back, Ali Beige. Uh, Ali is the one of the co-chairs along with uh, Jubair Patel uh, and also Richard Paris from Morgan Stanley who helped organize the CDMC work group at the beginning stage. So uh, Ali is the uh, head of data architecture and more at London Stock Exchange. So Ali, over to you just to uh, uh, bring us back to what started the uh, CDMC effort and uh, what is it all about? So over to you. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I want to tell a little story. So imagine Ollie Beige five years ago, I was working in Morgan Stanley's Center of Excellence for Data. I was a, a distinguished engineer there who was looking at engineering projects and, and, um, and data architecture principles. And we had a checklist of what you had to remember to build in your own application before it could go to cloud and and thousands of projects wanted to go to cloud and and there was me with my uh, clipboard uh, checking that you'd remember to do 14 key controls uh, before you were allowed to go live um in our environment in that organization we had automated our on-prem environment to have a lot of those controls built in but the cloud environment still allowed people to go live with projects that didn't have all these controls built in and that was that was a risk to us so we asked at the time um could the cloud service providers build all these key controls into their data services and they said well Morgan Stanley is a big customer but you're not that big so you know adding 14 new features to our 10 different data storage services and data management services is quite a big ask and we thought well what if we could get the entire industry you probably all everybody is suffering with this same problem um they all want to move to cloud um to improve improve their resiliency, to get to a more of a, a, an OPEX driven model and away from CAPEX, to reduce uh, complexity in their infrastructure and rebuild using standard services, and to be able to attract the best talent in engineering, uh, where you know new graduates and, and all the latest um, high spec engineers want to use these new innovative services on clouds. So you want to go there, but, but you can't unless you've got the controls right. Um, we asked uh, EDM Council if they could help us put together a working group for um, standardizing what good looks like for data on cloud. If you go to the next slide, um, Mike and, uh, and John from the EDM Council um, were very helpful in using their Rolodex and speed dialing all the chief data officers for the systemically important banks in the world. We managed to get 17 out of the 30 systemically important banks to contribute their data governance best practices. Um, we also had great partnership from uh, large scale technology platform providers, including AWS, Microsoft, Azure, Google, IBM, Snowflake, and lots of deep specialist technology companies who really know the data governance or data cataloging or data privacy or data security spaces. Um, and you can see some of the logos uh, in the top corner there. Uh, we we kicked that process off in May 2020, um, and if you progress through the the build on this slide, we've got some uh, some stats. Uh, we spent a year and a half uh, working through the 14 different areas. We had 300 subject matter experts uh, contributing to the standard, and we published our um, CDMC V1 spec in September 2021. We calculated we had around 45,000 subject matter expert hours go into the document. That was the initial stages of the working group coming up with the ideas of uh, you know what was working well at our individual organizations and could be standardized so that everybody could take advantage of that um we shied away from anything that was uh you know not a best practice at that time um knowing that we would come back and do a kind of phase two of cdmc and that's where cdmc plus fits in cdmc itself uh if you download the spec um, there are 160 pages of reference material. However, there's one page which covers uh, the entire spec, and uh, Jubair is going to take you through it shortly. Um, it's made up of six different components, including uh, governance and accountability, um, automatic cataloging and automatic classification of data, access control and usage tracking, uh, data protection and security, and privacy impact analysis, lifecycle, including quality and retention, and best practices in data, technical, and in fact, financial architecture from a business point of view. Um, you can see the six components have got 14 capabilities. These are the ones that I had on my, uh, actually, the, I had 10 of them on my checklist uh, to go um, uh, back in the to go up to cloud back in the day, but um, we've augmented those with things that have clear automation capabilities. So this isn't just a best practice guide; it's a guide of how you can automate these capabilities and sub capabilities in your environment. So it makes it harder for your engineers to do the wrong thing and easier for them to get it right. Um, we'll walk through these 
components, capabilities, and sub-capabilities. Um, we won't get to the 191 scorable measurable objectives, but they are, they are there if you take the multi-day uh, CDMC training course. To take you through uh, the 14 key controls, um, I'm going to hand you over to Jubair Patel, who was our incredible project manager and now super SME on the CDMC. Hello, everybody. Yeah, so Jubair Patel here. I lead um, our architecture for data governance products at Microsoft. Um, and as Ollie mentioned, I was um, honored to project manage, program direct, whatever you want to call it. Um, I heard the cats around the, the first CDMC initiative. Um, and this was really one of the core artifacts we delivered because obviously, as, as Ollie's mentioned, um, the framework and best practice framework and the evaluation criteria for organizations that are deploying CDMC in their own organizations was obviously one big part of what we did. But the second big part and the thing that makes CDMC unique is that we have a control framework by which we can measure our technology partners. So those that are providing us with cloud services, um, what, how does that weigh up to what's in the CDMC? And this control framework really outlines that. There's 14 key controls. Um, you have everything from effectively mapped to the sub capabilities in the CDMC. So how do you measure your business case using the data control compliance metrics um, and reporting around that? How do you automate ownership and assignment for ownership and workflows around ownership? Um, how do you ensure that you have, again, similar automation and workflow definition around all authoritative data sources? How can we help customers as, as technology providers deal with this very challenging and, and sort of newer issue around data sovereignty and cross-border movement. Um, how do we automate cataloging, classification, make sure these are always on features and things that can actually, you know, accelerate the data governance journey for customers. Um, how do we embed data definitions and classifications in the catalog with how we entitle and grant access to data in our data platforms? How do we capture data consumption purposes to make sure we're, data, we're using data ethically? Uh, which becomes even more challenging in, in the world of AI being pro proliferated. So, um, and now we're looking also at security controls and data privacy impact assessment. So security controls like masking, encryption, obfuscation, and then how do you ensure you have personal data or sensitive data managed from a privacy perspective? And then you have the final set of controls around the life cycle and, and technical architecture. Uh, so data retention, archival and purge, so the data life cycle being managed. Um, data quality measurement and management as well. And then finally, managing costs and data lineage in your technical architecture as well. So each of these comp each of these controls is one element of the overall capability pulled out and focused on to say, does our technical provider of cataloging and cloud solutions provide us with the capabilities to achieve these outcomes in line with the CDMC? And in terms of the makeup of the CDMC, so when you actually look into the actual document, you'll see six components at the top level, and then the 14 capabilities, which I just covered, and then 37 sub capabilities. So if you're looking at a way to really break this down, you don't necessarily need to look at every single capability. You look at what's in the scope of your organization. Um, you can look at then the specific sub capabilities, which contain everything from objectives and advice. Um, one of the items that we really focused on was not just advice for the organizations that are performing the CDMC in their own organizations, but advice to the cloud and technology providers. So how can we give advice to the likes of Microsoft and Google and Snowflake and, and all of the other organizations here on how we should better interoperate or better provide these services to customers? And then you have finally the questions, artifacts and scoring, which is then represented here. So the scoring methodology is really, if you are evaluating yourself, I think, Jim, if you could just go to the next slide. Give it up. There we go. Um, if you are evaluating yourself or you're bringing in a partner, a consultancy firm or an EDM council certified partner for CDMC, uh, this is the scoring method they would use to effectively evaluate your maturity against the CDMC. Okay. So if any of the organizations here have undertaken DCAM assessments or in fact any sort of assessment or for an audit capability or anything in the past, you'll be familiar with this type of scoring methodology. Uh, and this is the one that's, that CDMC aligns when you're performing an assessment. And then finally, this is the structure laid out, pretty similar to what I just mentioned, but you can see the document in the top right. It's a free download from the EDM Council website. I fully encourage anyone to download it, have a read for it themselves um, before maybe going down the journey of, of becoming sort of certified against the framework as well. There we go. Thanks very much, Jim. Okay, so Ali and, and Jaber, I think we were going to just split split the capabilities up uh, between the two of you, if Ali, you take us through the first three and then 
Yep, yeah. sounds good. So let's talk about component number one, which um, summarizes the the automation opportunities around governance and accountability. Um, what we're trying to get here is a really strong sense of ownership and business purpose around managing data. Um, what I what I won't do is just read the slide. So if we go to to the next, I think it's it's better to talk about the the, the core capabilities here. Um, the cloud data management business case being defined and government governed. This is this is important in a lot of cases. Uh, it's 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 optional in some organisations. It's really important in others. Um, it's a way of linking the way that you get technology projects or products uh, or initiatives funded uh, and being able to tie that back to the data assets that you need to be successful in those initiatives. Section 1.2 is about establishing very clear ownership for the data assets that you have in your organization. Um, you do need to have an owner because they are going to be the person who is going to see the rest of the information uh, from the control framework. They will see who's using the data, how much is it costing, which use cases are consuming the most, uh, which is driving that cost and are we getting the business value from it? Um, one of the key roles of the owner is um, to anoint the authoritative data sources and authorized redistributors. So in best practice in data governance, you only want to consume data from your highest quality sources. And it's down to the owner to determine, well, what is the most uh, high quality distribution point for this data? It might be coming straight from the source. Uh, in large organizations, typically you're putting it into some kind of redistribution um, hub, um, having a very clear list of what the data asset is, who owns it, and that owner having nominated the authoritative sources is, is critical. And the other main risk that we have from an accountability and governance point of view, as Jubert touched on before, is cross-border data sovereignty risks. So have you seen with the legislation that's been uh, developed in China, Russia, um, India, and a large number of other jurisdictions are working on this, there are very tight controls over certain types of data transfer, particularly data about the subjects of a jurisdiction. So if you've got uh, information about um, employees or customers uh, from that particular region, you may find that you're constrained. And when you're operating in a cloud environment, it's really easy to hit the distribute everywhere button uh, and accidentally break the law. So that this is about having those rules um, described in your control environment in advance as you define those data assets and making sure that the cloud environment won't allow you to uh, break the law by putting data somewhere that it's not allowed to be or by taking data out of a place that it's not allowed to leave. So this wonderful list of data assets we've been talking about defining ownership for and, and putting controls around, because um, section two is about the cataloging and classification of those data assets. Um, and the goal here is to try and utilize, particularly in, in the cloud environments where the cloud provider knows every piece of data that you have because they charge you for it, right? You get charged for storing that data, for moving it around. Um, there's no more dark data in your environment. There's only unclassified data. Um, so if we go straight to the to the controls here. All right. On the next slides, all right. There we go. Um, the key one here is that data is automatically put into your cataloging system as it's created. You don't have to retrospectively go in and register a data asset. You've just got the data showing up ready to be um, de defined and, uh, and classified. Um, now, clearly, lots of the data that gets created in environments is not made for sharing. It doesn't get a data definition. It doesn't represent any kind of risk until it moves out of the process that created it. Um, so there is there's a workflow here of um, creating accurate data definitions at the time that you need them. And that time that you need them is when you when you come to share that data. The nice thing about having an auto discovered set of data asset definitions in your catalog is that you can run one of the growing number of sophisticated data classifiers over that data, and it can try and work out for you what that data is. So uh, it can tell you if it's got PII data in it, or if it's a copy of one of your reference data sources that you didn't know somebody had taken, uh, or it can recognize certain characteristics of the data um, and, and say, look, this is um, confidential information, or this is sensitive information that's either highly restricted or material non-public information, or it's PII data. Um, and the rest of the CDMC framework really hangs off that classification. So once you've got automatic discovery of data assets and you've got an automatic classifier um, showing what is sensitive, and bear in mind in financial services where this started, 
all the data by default is sensitive. There's almost nothing in a bank that isn't sensitive um, because you're mixing uh, transactional data in, and client data um, inside all of these systems. So you want all of the controls to be switched on by default. So if we go to, uh, I don't know when we transfer over actually. It's, uh, uh, this is your last one and then Jubera picks up after this. Yeah, so, so for example, one of the key controls on sensitive data is having data oriented entitlements on it to enforce access control. So whether the data is sensitive because it's PII data or it's um, or it's private to the company or it's commercially sensitive data that you're only licensed to have 10 users of or 15 users of, um, being able to implement data oriented entitlements means that you can find um, that data no matter which service it's being processed by or stored in. Uh, let's say Ollie gets access to uh, some broker research data from my equity business uh, that LSEG has provided. Um, I'll be able to use that in my Python environment to do some data science, or I could load it into Tableau or ClipView or Power BI um, to do some visualizations, or I could load it into Excel. And it's, it's my identity associated with that data set that's the important thing, not which application I happen to be using to process it at the time. So if we go to those controls, uh, you can see uh, control 3.1, data entitlements are managed, enforced, and tracked. Um, this is a fairly complicated requirement. You've, you've all got entitlement systems that track your access to applications, but extending that for a data assets is, is hard unless you've got a really comprehensive list of data assets in your, in your catalog, which uh, you know um, control, um, control number 2.1 says that you will have. Um, we also uh, have developed metadata standards within CDMC that support not just managing entitlements for, for individuals, but entitlements for organizations who've bought commercial data sets. Um, and we've had a really great partnership with the team doing ODRL in this space uh, for their metadata for automation of uh, digital rights management. In section two, um, CDMC is describing the controls for ethical access and outcomes. So in particular, GDPR requires you to know what type of processing you're doing on data sets with PII data in them, because you need permission from the data subjects for certain sorts of processing. So, uh, you know, regulatory reporting, no permission required. However, if you're going to do customer prospecting, you need to know uh, that there's PII data in the data set. So um, making sure that your organizational rules are captured there and that you have a mechanism for detecting when the use of data has changed. So being able to detect that instead of my business process taking a copy once a day to do regular processing, I've got a data science team that's taking a copy every half an hour, and it looks like they're doing lots of slice and dice um, activities with it. Maybe they're doing customer prospecting, which is which is not allowed under GDPR. Over to Jaber. I'm going to hand over to Jaber. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, Jim, I, I think we've got an hour long session on each of protection and privacy in the actual core training. So trying to squeeze it into five minutes is going to be fun. But, um, you know, again, we're, we're here, here we're talking about the common security, the, the data security aspects that we put around data today, right? In terms of encryption, in many cases, obfuscation, in terms of masking or data loss prevention, all of the regimes which we currently have in place in most of our organizations. The key point that we're making with this particular capability around data security is attaching it to definitions in the data, which will help you understand where sensitivity exists, where it doesn't exist, where more controls need to be applied. And then in a lot of cases, in the way that technology is trending these days, uh, policies to actually enable the application of certain security controls on certain classifications or certain sensitivities of data is a big enabler for a lot of the analytics use cases that Ollie mentions, but also in the data sharing space that we're discussing in the CDMC Plus. Um, obviously, a huge part of, where, of what we're discussing when it comes to the mechanics of data sharing is the type of encryption you need for in-transit and in-use standards. So um, a lot of what we're discussing in the CDMC Plus, the foundation of that is based on the type of security standards we have for internal use, internal transit, and any external um, use cases that we might have as well. So um, in, in the security CDMC space, we do talk a little bit about the multiple layered security approach that we have. Um, that starts with obviously infrastructure, app, and into data. Um, but here we're really focusing on those four elements of encryption, obfuscation, and masking, data loss prevention, and also um, evidencing and auditing security controls. Um, on the privacy sides, um, there's a lot more about identifying sensitive data from a personal or even from a corporate sensitivity perspective. Uh, I'm understanding the types of requests that you're going to handle. Um, whether it's from a privacy impact assessment space or whether it's from a DSAR space, 
data subject right request base, whether it's from sort of consent management or even from a proxy and um, web a web privacy management side as well. So there's multiple yeah. angles that go into the data privacy framework that we've discussed. Again, a lot of it foundationally is driven by the classification capability that talks to the type of metadata that we need to capture to drive the privacy framework. But then the rest of the privacy piece is around how do you use privacy enhancing technologies um, such as you know automation of privacy impact assessments to ensure that you have a, a wide reaching net that's going to catch nearly all of your privacy sensitivity use cases. Um, and then how do you automate some of the more time consuming elements in the data subject right request handling. Um, I see that Jim's moving me on quite far, so I'll, I'll speak. <laughs> So onto data lifecycle management. And, and here we're really talking uh, about how do you manage and maintain the data lifecycle as it goes through the entire sort of process of the analytics lifecycle, but also from a sort of more regulatory um, retention sort of lifecycle as well. So uh, obviously through the analytics lifecycle, there's a slightly different approach to how you want to maintain and manage your data. Um, you may not have as many sort of regulatory and legal concerns when it comes to um, when it comes to how you're actually managing your life cycle in the analytics space, but definitely in the retention space and the purge space, you're going to have a number of different legal and regulatory requirements that apply. So how can we, again, use the definition of data that we've set up in the metadata to actually ensure that we have policies that will drive life cycle management in a catch all situation. So nothing slips through the gaps. We can apply legal holds when we need to apply legal holds. We can apply uh, policies to automatically purge and destroy data. We can evidence all of that. You know, those are the key characteristics of this control uh, and this capability. And then obviously the second part of this capability is data quality, um, data quality spanning a number of different sort of core capabilities, which includes data quality measurement, data quality reporting, data quality remediation processes, um, and then also data quality rules management, right? We've, we find quite quickly that rules have a life cycle of their own, um, which needs to be considered. So these are the two controls within this capability. Uh, and then finally onto data and technical architecture. So in this particular area, we're looking at how do you actually optimize a lot of your architecture in a way that means you are interoperable, that you are cost managed, that you have um, backup and recovery. And so you can protect yourselves, but also how do you understand, you know, how can we understand the cost associated with data as opposed to the infrastructure and application landscape and try and deduce data from that. Um, so there's a lot around those four elements. Um, and then finally, data provenance and lineage. Uh, one of the hottest topics, I'm sure, in nearly everyone's data platform conversations is generally lineage. Um, we probably spent about six weeks just trying to define provenance and lineage. So that should tell you how much detail went into this particular capability. Um, so yeah, so a lot of that in terms of interoperability is also demonstrated in the, in the interoperability meta model that we, pr we produced off the back of these requirements. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of very good sort of best practice when it comes to provenance and lineage in the documents around that. 